Welcome to the weekly update, where I'll go over the action in the market for the week of May 22nd through the 26th, and then we'll see how things look for the week of May 30th through June 2nd. We saw a pretty wild week on the daily charts. That helped some of our weekly charts to improve slightly. The S&P did advance on the week, but not by very much. A lot of the strength this past week came in Thursday and Friday session. Before I start going through the video, please know that I have a supplemental video posted on the channel. I posted this almost three weeks ago. It deals with the S&P 500 and interest rates and how they interact with each other. And some of those charts are starting to change a little bit, especially as the market is dealing with this whole debt ceiling issue. I do have a PDF of all the slides and charts available down in the description that you're welcome to download and look at. I do also have a private Facebook group that you're welcome to join. I do have a poll that's posted this week. I'll be starting a new poll for the upcoming week. Videos are also posted on Rumble. A little over a week ago, I ran into an issue where YouTube took my channel down for about three hours. I didn't know how long it was going to take because sometimes these things can go on for a number of days. It turned out to not be that big of a problem. However, if you come to YouTube and you like to watch these videos and you can't find me or my channel, Please jump over to Rumble. I also post the same videos on that site, and here is the channel where you can find those videos. Let's go back and talk about the week session. For the week, we were up 0.32%. We had been down pretty significantly, but on Thursday and Friday, we started to bounce back. Volume did rise to above average. That's been a little bit encouraging, especially later in the week on the updates. We saw volume really picking up. The technicals are still positive overall. We've switched back to short-term positive on the daily charts. We're seeing a lot of negative signs internally on the daily charts. That also can be seen in some of the weekly charts. The real issue right now is the debt ceiling, but behind all that is the bigger scenario of inflation and interest rates. Our trend is weakening overall, but the green line continues to be on top. So for the week, the Dow was down 1%, the NASDAQ was up 2.5%, the S&P up 0.3%, and small caps were pretty much unchanged. Looking over some issues for this week, please be reminded that the stock market will be closed on Monday for Memorial Day. I know if you're an American, that's a no-brainer, but a lot of folks that watch these videos don't live in the U.S., and so they need to be reminded that the market will be closed. The S&P did end up closing above 4,200. That's been kind of a big deal and a real source of upper resistance. Well, the fact that we could get above that and then close above that, not only on the daily charts, but also on the weekly chart, shows that there's a lot of improvement. There's still a lot of uncertainty about the debt ceiling, and by Friday, some of those concerns were eased. There's reports coming out that they're making progress, but at the time I record this, nothing has really been decided. Last weekend, Jenny Ellen came out and restated what she had said before, that June is a hard deadline for the debt ceiling and that the odds of the U.S. being able to pay its bills on June 15th are quite low unless we get a debt ceiling increase. House Speaker McCarthy also remained optimistic. Fitch also came out this past week and put the nation's AAA rating on credit watch negative. A little bit more that happened. We did have some Fed officials making some comments. Minneapolis Fed Kashkari said that the decision to pause in June is a close call. And he also said that if we do pause in June, that doesn't mean that the cycle is over. St. Louis Fed President Boulard, who's not an FOMC voter, said that he thinks two more rate hikes are needed this year. Fed Governor Waller, who's also a voter, said that we need to maintain flexibility on the best decision to take in June. Fighting inflation continues to be my priority. And Cleveland Fed President Mester, who's not a voter, said that when she looks at the data, it does look like the Fed will have to tighten a bit more. NVIDIA also, you probably heard about this, they came out with their earnings report, just blew everything away, and their future guidance also looks very positive. Marvel Technology also had a really good earnings report and was up strong. For the week, Treasury yields and the U.S. dollar were also up. So we're seeing interest rates going back up, but the dollar is showing a little bit of strength. On Monday, there was not a lot of conviction because of a lot of uncertainty dealing with the debt ceiling. The S&P briefly broke above 4,200 a number of times, but it ended up closing below that. On Tuesday, we saw more weakness coming into the market. There were some press reports coming out that there is no deal on the table right now. 
House Speaker McCarthy did come out and tell the GOP members that they were nowhere near a deal, while White House Minority Leader Jeffries told reporters that there was not a lot of progress being made on the debt ceiling. Representative McHenry told reporters that both sides still had significant differences on spending. There were also reports about some new COVID cases that are starting to come out in China. Then on Wednesday, the debt ceiling uncertainty pressured stocks. That's when we ended up seeing some declines. Then on Thursday, the major indices ended up being mixed. This is when NVIDIA came out with their earnings as well as their guidance. Then on Friday, the fears about the debt ceiling, they pretty much subsided. And the market started to believe that some kind of an agreement was near. Semiconductor stocks were again up strong on Friday. Looking at the poll for this past week, I asked four questions concerning the banking crisis. Do you think there's more to come? Everybody seems to agree with that. Concerning the banking crisis, do you think there's more to come? Or has it pretty much passed? Everybody thinks there's still more to come. Do you think the U.S. will enter a recession? Yes. In 2023, 90% yes, 10% no. There'll be a soft landing. Nobody thinks that it will be projected out into 2024. For the week that just ended, do you think that we would end up being higher, lower, or about the same? A little bit over half thought we would be higher. But then when you look out two weeks, most folks tend to think that we will be lower. Some Isabel Net blog charts that we can go through. It says, where did the earnings recession go? When we look back over history during the dot-com boom, they were down 28%. The great financial crisis, down 34%. During COVID, down 15%. But in 2023 so far, we've only been down 2%. Then credit, the great canary of high-yield bonds. This means junk bonds. They're not trading well at all. I beg to differ. This is a global index right here, which is showing some weakness. But when you look at the U.S. junk bonds, they're actually doing quite well. Percentage point difference between the S&P 500 and the equal weight. We're seeing a real divergence right now with the S&P going higher, the equal weight really underperforming. We can see right now that this is the biggest outperformance going back to 1999. According to this chart, a lot of the private clients from Bank of America, they've been sellers of stock in 2023. And this chart, I'm not quite sure about. It says 33% of large cap mutual funds are outperforming their benchmarks, meaning if you have an S&P 500 based fund, are you outperforming the S&P? The problem that I have with this is they don't tell us whether this is a passive mutual fund or an actively managed mutual fund, but overall they're doing worse than the overall market. But regardless of the kind of mutual fund, they're still up 33% overall, but that's less than average. Looking at corporate buybacks, we have the year over year, which is the light blue line, and then the four week average is the dark blue, where we see them both declining. This could be potentially negative. If companies are buying back their own stock now at higher prices, if they think the market's going to go lower, why not wait and buy it back then instead of running the risk of buying the stock now and seeing that as a loss? This chart takes a little bit of a different perspective and looks at the core CPI. When you look not only at the U.S., but also outside the U.S. in the U.K., the E.U., and Japan, where it shows inflation is really continuing to go up. Some charts that I have from Real Investment Advice, their weekly newsletter, they say at the top, why equities are rallying is simple, hope over evidence. So the red line going up is the optimism of analysts as they're giving upgrades. But when you look at the leading indicator, it still continues to decline. They're also suggesting that after Friday, this is what they call a classic breakout. We were finally able to get above the 4200 level. Now they're looking at about the 4300 level on this chart. Then looking at the Monetary Policy Conditions Index, this measures inflation, short and long rates, as well as the U.S. dollar. That's the black line, and it continues to come down as the Fed funds rate is starting to go up. We tend to not see that very often. So does that mean the Fed funds rate will eventually start coming back down? Or will this black line start going back up? Then looking at that same index and comparing it to the annual change on the S&P 500. The S&P is in red where it's been doing quite well. But the monetary conditions index year over year is showing some improvement. Then looking at that same index and comparing it to earnings. The red line and they're coming down as the monetary conditions index has been going up. The Fed funds rate, comparing it to CPI, they're getting almost to the same point now. And then valuation comparisons, you look at NVIDIA, where their price to sales ratio is 39, but their price to earnings ratio is shot up to 175. 
You can also see there's Apple, Microsoft, Google, and Meta, better known as Facebook. Looking at our charts, way over here, back to Monday, where we were pretty flat in Monday session, we did come up off the lows a little bit. But then on Tuesday, this is when we started to see some weakness. Wednesday, we gapped lower and were not really able to recover that. Then NVIDIA's earnings report came out. We gapped higher, shot all around at the beginning, but then spent the day clawing our way higher. Then we just kept that going on Friday and ended up closing above 4200 for the week, the NASDAQ 100 did the best, followed by the NASDAQ, and the S&P was up just a third of a percent. Year to date, the NASDAQ 100 and the NASDAQ are doing the best, with the S&P in third place. But when you go back to the all-time high, all of the indexes continue to be negative. Looking at our sectors, the tech sector did the best. It was up 4.64%. Communication did well, and discretionary. These are growth areas right in here where the other areas, especially the ones near the bottom, they tend to be more value plays. Looking at the relative rotation graph, we're seeing that tech and communication are still leading the way and doing quite positive, where we have a number of the sectors that are actually lagging and drifting more negative, where we have staples, healthcare, and utilities kind of right in between right now where discretionary is trying to make a bit of a comeback and is looking a bit better. Looking at the sectors just on the week, tech did the best followed by discretionary and communication services. All the other sectors ended up being down. Year to date, tech is in first place followed by communication and then discretionary. You have the industrials which are fractionally positive and all the other sectors are negative. Going back to the all-time high, energy is still in the lead, but it's giving back a lot of its gains. All the other sectors continue to be negative. Looking at sentiment, we're not extreme positive yet. We're more in the positive side. They label it as greed. Here's the historical chart where we had come down and given an extreme negative reading, and we've been bouncing up off of that. If we get to the 75 or above level, then we're getting extreme positive. We had the latest reading from Active Asset Managers. They came in at 65.51, not really an extreme reading. Looking at the VIX, it did go back up a little bit on the line chart and the bar chart, but we're still well below 20. The right X bear bull ratio continues to be just about at the midpoint. And then when you compare cash with the tech sector, when this line is going down, that means the tech sector is doing well. Well, this line is really going down. The latest reading from the American Association of Individual Investors, after being very pessimistic, they're showing a little bit of improvement. The ulcer index continues to show that there's no fear. Looking at the economy, here's the latest reading from GDP Now, the estimates, where the Atlanta Fed GDP Now estimate has us just under 2% for GDP. The consensus from the top 10 and bottom 10 have us about one and a half, where the bottom portion has us down just a little bit more than 1%. Here's what it looks like on a bar chart where we're looking positive across the board currently. The spread between risky bonds and not as risky bonds is still not really going up all that much. It came up just a little bit. The correlation is not very strong right now between that and the S&P 500. Looking at the financial conditions index, we're still below this black line. As long as we stay below that, that is positive. The tightening standards chart has not been updated this week, but it shows that Banks are being more strict with who they're lending money to. The real-time SOM rule recession indicator is still below this black line. We get concerned when it goes above the red line, but this hasn't been updated since May 5th. This chart has not been updated since May 1st. These are the probabilities of a recession. We're still not going up very high. Looking at the Brave Butters leading index, it's going a little bit above this line, but it hasn't been updated since May 1st. Looking at inflation, this is the inflation now cast where we came down just a little bit with the CPI inflation as well as the PCE inflation. And they're pretty much at the same point right now. FedWatch. Now, a week ago, there was an 82.6% chance that the Fed would be unchanged after the next meeting. This has now dropped to 35.8%. We're seeing a little bit more economic strength. And with some of the Fed speak that we heard, that makes the market think that there's still going to be another rate hike. The Fed balance sheet continues to drop off again as it's doing quantitative tapering. And this just shows the assets continue to fall down. Looking at our breadth, 
We're still positive, but we're declining a little bit based on price. We're showing some improvement, but still under the moving average based on volume. The new highs, new lows, not seeing a real improvement here. It's ticking back up, but our four period is still negative. We're pretty much flat with our 10 period. The advanced decline ratio is positive. It's still above zero and advancing. Accumulation distribution remains positive. Then looking at our trend, the ADX is trying to turn up, but it's not quite above its moving average yet. The green line's on top, even though it declined, we still default to positive. Our rune indicator is switching back more to positive when we look at the oscillator. The mass index is not generating a signal. We look at the daily chart first where we finally were able to break right above this resistance level. Can we keep going or are prices going to stall out at this level? The trend channel, we're a little bit above the midpoint going back to 2009. We're also above the pivot point for the month, that's positive. We're above the 50 period simple moving average, that's positive. The long term trend continues to be positive. The Swindland Trading Oscillator, this decline based on price and volume and both of them are below zero, that's more negative. The McClellan Oscillator, still below zero and declining, that's also negative. The Summation Index based on price is coming right down to the zero line where it's already dropped below the zero line based on volume, but it did tick back up slightly this past week. We're also seeing this divergence on the daily chart where volume is looking stronger than price. The bullish percent index, we're seeing pretty much the same thing on the daily chart. We've now dropped below 50. That is negative. The Bollinger Bands are not giving an extreme positive or negative reading. They're above the dashed line, so that is positive overall. The PMO study still shows the PMO going up. We're declining based on price as well as volume. The PMO study, we're still declining from the PMOs that are rising. We're declining with the buy signals, and we're also declining with the PMOs that are above zero. Some of this is coming out. There's not a real wide participation in this upward movement of the S&P. Looking at our oscillators, we're turning down a little bit with the slope. We're still positive with the TSI and the MACD. The PMO, PPO, TRIX, and KST still remain positive. We're seeing kind of a mixed bag right now on the daily charts. Jake and oscillator continues to be positive. The force index is also positive. The money flow is also positive. The chicken money flow continues to be positive. The rate of change, we were up slightly, so we're above the dashed line. Going back 50 weeks, we are looking more positive. The RSI 14 is still above 50 and advancing. That's positive. With the special K, we're just about right on top of this red line. On the daily chart, the special K came right up to the red line from being negative, and so far that's been rejected. Will this fall through and actually turn more negative in the longer term? The Stoke RSI is still extreme positive, as is the Williams percent R. The Vortex, the green line's on top, but it was pretty much sideways. The Copic Curve, barely generating some kind of a buy signal here. We did have a buy signal generated on the daily charts. The Ultimate Oscillator is still positive, and we're still well above support here on our longer term weekly chart showing the moving averages and the Fibonacci retracement levels. Looking at our different charts, the Heiken Ashi still remains positive, the Kegi is positive, the Renko is positive, the three line break continues to be positive. The ease of movement, looking at the 14 period, we're just right on the dashed line. Nothing new generated with the point and figure chart, we had an ascending triple top breakout. So that is positive and still on the books, even though no more X's or O's were drawn this week. Looking at our trading systems, the Elder Impulse system for the S&P remains positive. The Parabolic SAR is also positive with the dots underneath, and we're also seeing that same thing on the daily charts. Some broad market looks where the S&P has been trying to break through this 4200 level. The mid caps are really underperforming just when you look at the index, and the small caps are even showing a bit more weakness. The Dow continues to be in an overall uptrend. It came down to this moving average, but was able to bounce up off of that. The NASDAQ is also really performing well right now, as is the NASDAQ 100. The mid caps, they're looking more weak, just when you look at the index. Now, when you go inside of these indexes and look at the small caps and the mid caps and look at their growth to value ratio, growth is really doing well. But the indexes themselves are under a lot of pressure. 
Here are the small caps which are in an overall downtrend. The NYSE is falling off a little bit where the Wilshire is pretty much chopping sideways but in an uptrend. All stocks continue to do quite well and are in an uptrend. The biggest software companies continue to be in an overall uptrend. The FANG index continues to break out, but it still hasn't come back to its all-time high. ARC still has a little bit of trouble. It was up only 1% on the week. When you see other tech stocks that did very, very well, to see ARC really lagging behind is probably discouraging. Looking at the bank sector, where we're still showing a lot of weakness overall, the RSI showed a bit of improvement but the MACD continues to be negative even though it's trying to turn up. The deposits in banks actually ticked up a little bit in the latest reading, but it's still showing that more people are withdrawing their money overall. Some other measures that we look at, Dow theory, we're seeing a bit of a negative divergence where the Dow's been going more or less sideways. We're seeing a little bit more weakness with the transports. Shorter term, we're also seeing a lot more weakness with the utilities. The CRB index continues to be in an overall downtrend. Copper is starting to come down, but it's still in an overall uptrend. Oil has been pretty much chopping sideways. It's staying right around the 70 to 72 to 73 level. The dollar is trying to stage a bit of a rebound and showed some improvement. Gold continues to be in an uptrend. Silver is also in an uptrend. Looking at bonds and interest rates, the total bond ETF continues to be in an uptrend. And when you look internationally at the U.S., U.K., and Germany, rates are really starting to go back up. As I always say, Japan is their own little story that we might have to deal with at some point in the future. Looking at the daily chart, saw a little bit of a mix between the shorter term and longer term maturities. But overall, we were up on the week for the 10-year. That's what I follow the most. Looking at the move index, which measures volatility in bonds, this is a daily chart showing how volatility has picked up over the last few days as volatility in stocks has been declining. But when you look at the spread between the two, which is the green line, it's actually been dropping off. And we can compare that to the red line, which is the S&P 500. Then down on the bottom, this correlation shows that they have a real strong tendency to go in the same direction. On a monthly chart, stocks continue to outperform bonds. And then this is interesting. You look at the one month yield, which is pretty much cash, and then you subtract the three month yield. Now, logic would tell you that you should get a negative number. You're taking cash and subtracting something that you have to hold on to for three months. That's when this chart really goes down. But we're seeing it really spiking up where the one month yield is actually greater than the three month yield. Some relative studies. Here's our intermarket analysis chart. Next week, I'll have another chart going back to the beginning of 2022. I just like to keep some context on here. Oil is still in the lead overall, followed by the dollar, gold. Those are all positive going back to the all time high where stocks and bonds continue to be underwater. The NASDAQ to S&P 500 ratio is showing that the NASDAQ is really outperforming. The S&P 100, which are the biggest stocks inside the S&P 500, they are really outperforming. Growth is starting to show a lot of improvement compared to value. And gold is still in an uptrend overall compared to the S&P, but it did fall back. Bonds continue to underperform, at least in the shorter term maturities, when compared to stocks. The gold to US dollar ratio came right up to this downward sloping trend line and we've been falling back with this ratio. Low volatility stocks continue to be out of favor where they were much in favor in 2022. Energy is really seeing a lot of weakness when compared to tech. And discretionary, even though it's in an overall downtrend, is still showing a lot of improvement when compared to staples. Some of this could be attributed not so much to discretionary strength, but more to staples weakness. Looking at the secular and cyclical trend studies, this is a long-term buy signal that we had here generated last October. We came up out of that. That's the NYSE breadth thrust, and that lasts indefinitely. We also have a Zweg NYSE breadth thrust, which was triggered back in March. That is also still on the books, even though we've been seeing some weakness in this overall thrust model. This is a new chart by Zahorchak. This tries to measure buy and sell signals and it has a really complicated way of calculating this. For 2022 and 2023, we were down here in negative territory. Just recently, we shot up and now this has generated a buy signal. Looking at our momentum studies, going back to 1998 to 2004, we tried to break out above these two trend lines, but the MACD was not confirming any strength there. 
The same thing happened in 2007 into 2008. We broke above this trend line, but the MACD was going sideways. We compare that to now, where we have broken out above this trend line, the MACD is still doing quite well and is positive. So this time does look a little bit different, at least so far. So what's the outlook for the upcoming week? Here is the economic calendar. I won't read this to you. I don't talk about economic reports in the weekly video because I deal with those each day in the daily video. We're still looking more positive overall, but we are seeing some underlying weakness in the weekly charts. We're seeing that same kind of thing in the daily charts. Right now, it's all about the debt ceiling. It's all about the three-day weekend. Once we get beyond this debt ceiling issue, it'll probably jump back to inflation and interest rates. And then also wondering if we're going to get any more banking information. The only day this upcoming week where Fed officials will be giving a speech, that's on Wednesday. There'll be one at 8.50 by Governor Bauman. Then at 1.30, there'll be a speech by Governor Jefferson. Looking at the Stock Traders Almanac, we're just finishing up the week after expiration where we tend to be more positive than negative. And then looking at things for May 30th, which will be Tuesday. The Dow, the S&P, and the NASDAQ do have a historical positive trend on those days. We're coming into the latter part of May where we typically see some weakness, but overall, we tend to be up almost 60% of the time and down 40% of the time. This is a chart put out by Stock Traders Almanac where throughout May, whether it's a pre-election year or any year, we typically see some weakness. Now we're coming into that part of the year where historically we have seen some strength, we will be on the 21st trading day of the month on Tuesday, where it tends to be up overall in a pre-election year. And then we're also coming into this pre-election year after midterm bear. That's the gray line. That's what we're following right now. We see some weakness in May. Historically, things have typically improved after this. Also seeing that same thing in this chart where we have the pre-election after midterm bear. That's the green line, weakness in May, showing some improvement. When you take all pre-election years, we also see weakness in May and then some improvement. When we look at just May, it tends to underperform all the rest of the months in the year. But during a pre-election year, we look at this blue line here. But historically, there has been a positive return. The debt ceiling debate. This is another chart put out by Stock Traders Almanac. The black line is what the S&P did in 2011. The blue line is what the S&P is doing right now. And then there's different events that have been annotated on here where we saw some initial weakness. We tried to bounce back up. And then late July into August, we saw a lot more weakness. We're also coming into that period right now, showing some strength and then some more weakness after that before we start to see a bit of a recovery. So what are our scenarios? And this just applies to Monday. We can't really go with the down one, even though we're seeing a lot of negatives inside the S&P as well as the broader market. Can't really go with the up one now, even though we have shifted back over to short-term positive because our ADX is still showing on the daily and weekly charts that we're not trending right now. But the ADX is still above its moving average and getting a little bit stronger. It might be able to turn back up and go across the moving average soon. But with both of those, we remain below 20. However, the green line is advancing. Warning signs. This is just for Tuesday's session. There are numerous negative divergences that are all coming together, and I deal with those extensively in the daily video. There's a lot of internal weakness things that we're seeing as well. The VIX is still showing a lot of complacency. The NYSE advanced decline line is breaking below the trend line, and I deal with that in the daily video. The cumulative new highs and new lows for the NASDAQ are showing weakness. The small cap index is underperforming, and the mid cap index generated a recent death cross but again, when you start to look at growth inside of especially the mid caps, we're seeing some real strength there. Earnings season continues, but at some point it should come to an end. We had a recent carpet curve buy signal generated on the daily charts. The Pring bottom fissure also generated a buy signal. Longer term seasonality and setups, those still apply to the whole year. We're seeing a real switch on the daily charts going from a risk off posture back more to a risk on posture. Lower price levels may provide support if we start to fall. The S&P is really starting to outperform the utilities and that typically is a very good thing for the S&P. The NASDAQ and NASDAQ 100 continue to break out. The Staples to S&P 500 ratio is really showing a decline and that could also give some support to stocks. 
Small and mid-cap growth is showing strength over the longer period, especially going back to the beginning of February. And then will a resolution in the debt ceiling crisis produce some kind of a short-term rally? So thank you. I hope you found this helpful. After this, I will be preparing the intermarket analysis video. You'll notice in this video, I didn't do any current market valuation charts. Those hadn't been updated by the time I got ready to record. If they're available, I will provide those in the intermarket analysis video. Have a wonderful Memorial weekend, and I will talk to you in the next video.